Showtime. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Ridgewood Village Council, public workshop, June 26, 2019. The time is 7.30 p.m. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by a posting on the bulletin board in Village Hall, by mail to the Ridgewood News Director, and by submission to all persons entitled to same, as provided by law of a schedule including date and time of this meeting. Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Knudsen. Here. Councilman Seaton. Here. Councilman Voigt. Here. Councilwoman Walsh. Here. Mayor Hache. Here. Please stand for flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join us in a moment of silence in honor of the brave men and women serving in our nation's armed forces and as first responders. Thank you. We'll uh, begin with public comments, not to exceed three minutes per person. Come on up. Good evening. Is the microphone on? The microphone is a light on at the base. There it is. Much better. Okay. Uh, my name is Douglas Wamsley. I live at 119 Monte Vista Avenue. At the Village Council work session on May 22nd, I raised the issue of all-day commuter parking on the undesignated section of Monte Vista Avenue between Heights Road and Monroe Street. First of all, I would like to thank you for your prompt attention to the matter. I understand that Sergeant Chuck and Mr. Christopher Rudis Hauser reviewed the matter and at the Village Council meeting on June 5th provided some commentary in that regard. Namely, Sergeant Chuck did acknowledge that there was a problem with day-long commuter parking on the undesignated section of Monte Vista and that the problem was not caused by the work at the train station. I, I would agree with that. At that time, they seemed to be suggesting a three-hour rather than a two-hour time limit on parking on that section of Monte Vista. And I would like to state that I am in agreement with that suggestion. And as importantly, I'd like to reiterate that the issue of multiple commuter cars on that section of Monte Vista on a daily basis continues even through today. Since that meeting, uh, we received a letter late this afternoon from Mr. Rudis Hauser proposing a four-hour limit six days a week on Monte Vista Avenue, Park Slope, and Madison Place. Again, I would support that proposal as well. Although I have a slight preference for a three-hour restriction instead of four hours, mainly because Park Slope is currently under a three-hour restriction, and it creates less change on Madison Place, which is substantially all a two-hour restriction, except for a small portion, which seems to be four hours. But in either event, a three- or four-hour restriction addresses the crux of our issue, which is the all-day commuter parking on that section of Monte Vista, and I look forward to finalizing the proposal. I'll submit my comments in writing to Mr. Rudis Hauser as he's requested. And there are other neighbors that are prepared to provide their opinion on the commuter parking issue in that area and uh, their support of the parking restriction. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi, Patricia Smesco. I live on 89 Monte Vista, and actually my section of Monte Vista has no parking from 7 to 11 a.m. It's a two-hour limit, and that really isn't working either because people are still parking there, and I've been, I call the village, and then they come and ticket them. Now, sometimes if I don't catch them and you know, call the village, you know, if it's past like 10 o'clock, they are then allowed to park there all day long. Another problem is, um, if you're familiar with heights and it you know, goes from Monte Vista, that little curve, mm -hmm. people fly down there. And they're not even just parking on Monte Vista, sometimes now they're parking on heights. So you'll have one person parking on both sides of heights. It's so narrow, people are flying through there. So it's not just a Monte Vista problem, is also part of heights as you know going up um, north like towards Sheridan because people are parking on Heights Road for you know just they're all commuters so just above Madison and then up well it's Madison Monta Vista, Monta Vista and then Sheridan got it 
and people are parking from Monta Vista to Sheridan, and they're parking on both sides of Heights. And if you're familiar how curvy that road is and how people fly down that road so fast, someone's just going to get killed because there's no, there's no space, and, and you can't see. Because uh, I'm not sure the, there's a big pine trees on the corner of Montevis on Heights, there's a Tudor house. This, the Basus, I'm not sure their address, but they park there, and then they park, and then a, it's a, actually it's a green Subaru, and then there's a white minivan that parks on the other side of the street. So it's not just a Monte Vista problem, it's circling up. And I noticed in town today with the new uh, parking spots at the train station, there's empty spots. So maybe they should find parking there. Good evening. Hi, good evening. I'm Michelle Boers. I live at 138 Monte Vista on the corner of Park Slope. I'm here to say I am in favor of the um, parking restrictions to have the sign there. I find it very dangerous. Uh, the commuter parking, which I've seen every day, I've actually called a few times about the parkers who park on Monte Vista. And when the landscaper, landscaping trucks come to actually do work um, on Monte Vista, it really creates a very narrow throughway. And Monte Vista really has become a cut through for a lot of people. I understand that. Um, it, you know, you can't stop that, but, um, but it doesn't make it very dangerous. There's no um, sidewalks. The sidewalk actually ends in front of um, my house when you go up towards Park Slope there's no um, sidewalk so there's no way as somebody like myself who walks my dog on that street there's you have to go into the street in order to walk up to Heights and then when you've got parking on both sides it really becomes a very dangerous situation um, so I think this would hopefully alleviate the the problem so at least everyone could park on one side and leave one side where people could walk and at least see the oncoming traffic uh, I know we have a lot of children on our block. I worry about them. My children are older, but I know I have a lot of kids who live on Park Slope and my neighbors next door, and it's not safe for them because of a reason any sidewalk for them to, to, you know, to carry on up to Heights Road. So I'm in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Pamela Perrin, 123 Kenilworth Road. Slightly different topic. A year or two ago, I was walking on the corner of Kenilworth and Spring, and an accident happened right in front of me. Bam! And I was so stunned, I, I, I couldn't even shout fast enough to prevent it. Um, and there was discussion afterwards, and maybe because of other incidents, um, about making the intersection of Kenilworth and Spring into a four-way stop. But I gather that either because of Sergeant Chuck's analysis or Chris Rudershauser's evaluation, it wasn't appropriate to put a four-way stop there. And what's there now is a brand new stop sign on the roadway. I've never seen anything like it in Ridgewood. It must be three or four feet round and drivers coming down Kenilworth can't possibly miss it. It is a very good solution to the problem, I think, and I would imagine that the statistics will bear it out. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, you'd have to be blind to be a driver and not see this stop sign. And yet the beauty of it is, if you're a pedestrian, you have a, a different perspective. From 20 feet away, it's invisible. So you don't get the, I think it's called signage pollution or something like that. Ms. Maylander mentioned it. Mm -hmm. From down the street, you only see the one vertical stop sign. You don't see the, the one that's horizontal on the roadway. So it's great for pedestrians. It's great for drivers. And it's a solution that I'd like to see elsewhere in Ridgewood. I don't know if it would work, say, on Gilbert coming down to Hope Street because that's a hill. But I did want to tell you, I think it's a very good solution. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hello. Hi, I'm Danielle Flynn. I'm another neighbor on Monta Vista Avenue, 146. And um, my neighbor, Michelle, told me about the meeting tonight. 
And I also would support measures to eliminate the um, commuter parking um, Monday to Friday. Um, I do hope that restrictions would not include weekends because that would be only really affecting the residents rather than the commuters. Um, and I think residents are pretty aware of you know not um, wanting the street to be more congested. Um, also, I'm wondering if if you would consider uh, some sort of placard we could put on our cars if we did have workers there during the week where we did need on-street parking. I have a single car driveway, so if anything's happening, I really do need to park on the street sometimes or have them park on the street. So just something to consider. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, we'll close uh, public comment. Um, sorry, but before we move forward, I know there was a couple of questions that were asked. One was just recently about the placards. Is, is that something that we've implemented anywhere else, and how easy or feasible is it to do? Um, we've implemented one out of the two at the Kenilworth Spring intersection. Um, we're waiting for suitable weather, uh, and the signal division will install the second one. No, the, one, the placards for Monday for parking. Oh, parking, that's the yeah. stop sign. Um, we generally don't have resident placards or stickers for like a particular neighborhood. Uh, it becomes problematic with enforcement. It has been an issue raised by residents throughout the village over the years. Again, I would defer to you folks in the council if you wish to implement that. It is a popular request for many areas. But the issue has been enforcement, is that what you're saying? It can get very confusing with enforcement. Um, and then there's always the enforcement challenges if a guest comes and they forget to put the placard in a visible location and then they get a violation of summons issues issued and then we have the court, issue, court battle and so forth. Okay. Well, I guess we can look into a, some creative ways to, to doing it. I think the, the ordinance that I notified the residents with the letter we sent out, we're proposing a four hour limit um, in discussion with the police department that's felt that that's a limit that allows a landscaper to say service them on, uh, delivery people to come and go, even to get maybe a dishwasher installed. And it isn't a 24 seven, it's only I think from seven in the morning to maybe eight in the evening. Right. So if you have a party or an event at home, people arrive at six, the restriction is gonna end at eight and you'll be good till the next morning. And then uh, you were mentioning the um, the stop sign. Yeah, the decals the that was just mentioned. We've installed one of the two. Uh, they're thermoplastic. Uh, we're trying to get a, a break in the weather, and we'll get the other one done. We've installed the one on the southbound direction of Kenilworth, and we have to put one on the northbound direction of Kenilworth. And again, it's something we want to see. I'm glad to hear the reaction from a resident there on how it seems to be working. Um, we may consider it further in other locations because. It is just another tool in the toolbox. We have to keep mixing things up to keep the motorists aware of the traffic regulations they're facing. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. So, yeah, just two things. Um, on the, the location on Monte Vista that's presently 7 to, 7 to 11 right now. So just in the interim, so maybe we could have our PEOs do a regular um, kind of just drive through there every day because right now it's still 7 to 11 yes so why don't we just have them go through there and you know start to enforce if, um, I'll, I'll send that request over to Sergeant yeah. Chuck for it to be put into their uh, drive yeah. route list. and then just for um, the Kenilworth <laughs> spring um, scenario that four-way stop sign I don't know if you just want to explain why because we went down there we met and we kind of went through that whole thing yeah. and there was a reason why we couldn't do the four-way stop yeah. so maybe you just want to explain that four-way stop signs are difficult it is an intersection control <laughs> device it needs to meet uh, a number of warrants uh, warrants is the technical term that the manual of uniform traffic control devices requires us for any kind of control at an intersection be it a stop sign or a traffic signal or in this case the request for a four-way stop sign uh, right now, we did not see or did not th find any warrants that would support a four-way stop intersection. Uh, again, things change over time, so we'll work with, I'll work with the police department, and we'll see if conditions change if something further warrants it. Thanks. 
Thank you. Sure thing. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, manager's report. Uh, yes, Ma Mayor. Um, Heather is on vacation this week, and instead she got a, a two. For, you got a two for one special with Richard and myself. Uh, Heather, his office graciously provided the manager's report. The next village council work session is scheduled for Wednesday, July 10th at 7:30 p.m. in the village courtroom. Uh, the expansion of the train station parking lot is almost complete. Uh, the striping was completed last Saturday. Uh, we thank everyone for their patience, and hopefully people can see that it's open and can be used by our commuters and people desiring to park. Fourth of July celebrations will take place next week. Um, if you plan on putting out chairs, they're already out there in some locations. Best spots go quickly. I saw that the ones on Linwood Avenue are out this morning. <laughs> I don't know if that's a record, but it must be a great spot. <laughs> the parade is from 10 a.m. to noon. The celebration continues on Veterans Field. Gates open at 6 p.m. for music and fireworks at dark. As this is an all-volunteer event, the sale of fireworks tickets is critical. It helps support the cost of the event. Tickets are now on sale at Backyard Living, Bookends, Connect One Bank, The Daily Treat, Golf of Brook Farms, Hillman Electric, Town & Country, and the wine cellar. Fireworks tickets and the 50-50 tickets are also available for purchase at the Richwood Public Library and at the Farmer's Market. Advanced tickets are $10 each for ages 6 and up. Ticket prices increase at the gate entrances on July 4th for $15 for adults and $10 for children ages 6 through 12. Children under 5 and under are admitted for free. While the parade is free, firework tickets are required for entrance to Vets Field. Donations for the firework tickets is one of the celebration's largest sources of income. For any additional information, there's a website, uh, www.ridgewoodjuly4th.com. Anyone and everyone is welcome to go to the website for further information. Uh, a reminder, dog licenses are due for renewal at the end in the month of June. And after July 1st, a $20 late fee will be charged. Dog owners were reminded by mail or email to complete the renewal form and close a check and mail it to the health department. Our health department is open in Village Hall from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Monday through Friday. If you have any questions related to the licensing of your dog or other health matters related to your dog. The farmer's market is open for our 2019 season on Sunday, July on June 23rd. That means it already opened up. It is open every Sunday through October 27th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on the west side of the train station. It's in the portion of the parking lot just north of where we enlarged the parking area. This is truly a small, old-fashioned farmer's market. Come and meet the farmers who grow and sell the food. Try a variety of fresh vegetables and beautiful and delicious fruit. In addition, there is a jam man with different flavors of jam. Bella Mozzarella, a fresh cheese emporium. Picalicious, Bounty Bakery, Arthur Avenue style, and organic bread with some new surprises. The Ridgewood Farmer's Market is a real farmer's market and is brought to us by the members of the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Ridgewood Recreation Day Camp began yesterday and has over 400 children participating from grades 1 through 6. <laughs> Lots of fun and special events are planned for this summer. The Ridgewood Guild is sponsoring Art in the Park evening events, Friday, July 12th and August 2nd. Take a stroll in the park and enjoy the music and artwork displayed by local artists. Art is for sale those evenings with the proceeds benefiting the Ridgewood Guild. Uh, a reminder for everyone, Graydon Pool has opened for our 2019 summer season. Weekend hours are from 10 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. Weekday hours are 12 noon to 7.30 p.m. Residents can purchase memberships in person at the pool office or at www.ridgewoodnj.net backslash community pass. Amenities and programs offerings include the spray fountain, Adirondack chairs, shade systems, uh, a recreational game area, picnic area with tables and charcoal grills. The Graydon pool area is Wi-Fi accessible. The Water's Edge cafeteria is open daily from noon to 7 p.m., Swim lessons are available, and there is story time under the pavilion and also a lending library. There will be special events, movie nights, concerts, and more. 
The Cashow Memorial Shell, located here on Veterans Field behind the library, provides free music, free popular music concerts on Tuesday and Thursday nights at 8.30 p.m. in June, July, and early August. Bring a chair or a blanket to enjoy these free concerts under the stars. This program is presented through the generous sponsorship of several local businesses and the village of Ridgewood. The senior bus is available for transportation to several of these performances for those residents desiring it. Uh, if you wish the senior bus to pick you up and bring you, contact the manager's office at area code 201-670-5500, extension 203. Front row lawn chairs are provided by Age Friendly Ridgewood for the bus riders. The Ridgewood Guild provides movie under the stars on Wednesday nights twice a month in June, July, and August in Memorial Park at Van Ness Square at sundown. This summer they will be showing Chicago on July 10th, Sleepless in Seattle on July 24th, The Sixth Sense on August 7th, E.T. on August 21st. Bring your chair or blanket and enjoy the show. Come on down. Heather wishes to remind everyone that Parking in, the vill in all village-owned parking lots after 3 p.m. does not require a permit. Time restrictions, often a maximum of three hours, and other parking fees are those still in effect. The Mayor's Wellness Festival is slated for Sunday, September 22nd, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. in Memorial Park at Van Ness Square. All local health, medical, fitness, and wellness service providers are welcome. New this year is a healthy food court and picnic area. Uh, contact the Parks and Recreation Department for further information. Thank you. Thank you. Move on to Council Reports. Councilman Seaton. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the Ridgewood Environmental Advisory Committee and the Green Team met last week, so um, we are coming up with a plan to educate residents about the plastic single-use plastic bag ban and uh, we're hopefully going to finalize a good portion or most of that plan by um, the next meeting in July and uh, I'll start rolling it out in um, July and August and really kick it in for the uh, fall months leading into the winter when more people are around and there's more activity in town and um, that's all I have. All right. Deputy Mayor. Just real quick, uh, planning board meets next Tuesday uh, at 730 right here in this courtroom and uh, I didn't know part of my 4th of July committee report would be um, <laughs> delivered by the uh, alternate village manager, standing village manager, whatever you <laughs> work today. Um, but anyway, I'm just going to expand on it just a little. So the 50-50 um, tickets will be available also at uh, McMurphy's July 3rd um, in the evening, and that will be from gone all paperless so I have to follow this along here um, from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. just as a reminder the 50 50 tickets for the past few years have been a hundred dollars a piece and we've sold um, up to 600 so that was the 50 50 with multiple prizes uh, this year we've reduced the price to $20 so the 50 50 tickets will also be available on the field um, this will allow the the uh, 4th of July committee to sell actually hopefully more tickets and help uh, with the the uh, funding of the program also um, if there's anybody who's interested in tickets you can visit Ridgewood July 4th website and there's some information there how to reach Tara Masterson um, go on Facebook there's a lot of different ways to purchase tickets you can just shoot an email and the tickets for um, on the field are also available right now those are e-tickets and we urge everyone um, to consider purchasing not consider do it uh, purchasing a 50-50 ticket, uh, consider making a donation, and um, just be reminded this is a, an all-volunteer program, and it is a 501c3. It, the uh, July 4th program receives no direct funding from the Village of Ridgewood, and so the, um, as I've explained in the past, costs have gone up, and ticket sales and prices have remained flat, and we do encourage residents to help out. Uh, thanks to all who support, volunteer, donate, and work to make this celebration a great success year after year. We look forward to seeing everyone next week at July 4th. Thank you. Councilman Walsh. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the only thing that I have to report on is the um, granting applications for um, the state library 
grant is actually coming out finally. We weren't sure of the cool, date, wow. and now it's coming out July 1st. Um, okay. We will have 60 days to uh, review, make questions back, or everybody in the state will have that ability. Um, and then um, probably somewhere thereafter, um, we will probably do the grant application. Um, the library did a video. I got a sneak peek at the video that they're going to um, they're going to submit for everybody to see. We're going to send it out via social media um, to give everybody a, a better idea of the process and um, and why this uh, grant application is going to be filled out by the library. So um, that's all going to be probably happening next week sometime. Um, and then it's going to give the public the ability to also give some feedback onto what uh, what are some of the ideas as we fill this application out. So I would imagine the application would be finished. Um, we don't have the date as to exactly when it has to be in. It's kind of like an RFP. They're going to give us several different dates. Um, but I guess we'll find that out once we get the full package from the state. Um, and it still is a uh, $125 million grant, and that's going to be eligible for anybody in the state of New Jersey that wants to submit an application. And that's July 1st? July 1st is when we're going to basically be able to get the packets. Hmm. And then we'll go from there, see what's in it. Okay. Interesting. That's it. That's yeah, all I have. Same. Councilman Boyd. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Citizen Safety Advisory Committee met last Thursday. Um, next Monday, uh, the Mayor and I will be meeting with residents regarding the parking issues in and around Sherman Place. Uh, Starbucks continues to be an issue. Uh, Monday morning, I watched a white Volkswagen make a U-turn going from east to west on Franklin Ave around the cones that had been placed in the road. Uh, the cones obviously are not a deterrent. Um, the mid-center lane for the left-hand turns be is uh, a left center lane for left-hand turns between Oak and Cottage uh, being considered. Uh, the village is, is going to be seeking approval from the county to do this. Uh, the village will be extending the sidewalks past Hillcrest towards Heights on the south side of West Glen uh, this summer as well. It's the intention to uh, extend the sidewalks on the north side of West Glen from Heights towards Monroe. Uh, we examined some of the issues with cars speeding in the lawn section, um, most especially engineering is considering installing an island marking at the intersection of Berkshire and Arcadia Roads. Uh, as well, the village will be examining a, a school bus stop at Newcomb Road and possibly in installing some signage that goes south on Newcomb Road that a bus stop is ahead. So our children that are crossing the street on Newcomb uh, will hopefully be safely uh, across before people start to, to uh, go down that road. Uh, Jane Remus, uh, as part of the Stop, Look, and Wave organization, has been working with the schools to identify safe places to drop off children in the morning near the schools. Such that they don't cross uh, the street, so such that they can cross the streets easily uh, via crossing guards, and the cars don't create traffic jams near the schools. So, looking at kind of remote areas where that can happen and make uh, traffic a little bit easier around the schools in the morning. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a few things here. Um, just uh, in the last week, on Saturday, June 21st, there was a Maypole and Midsummer celebration at the Children's Sensory and Butterfly Garden at the Stable. A big thank you to the Conservancy for Ridgewood Public Lands for hosting along with Ridgewood apiarist Frank Mortimer and his wife Sophie, Sophie Mortimer, and also our uh, very own Ridgewood Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, this event was really part of this National Pollinators uh, Week, um, which is why uh, Frank Mortimer was, was crucial in the planning. And I also want to congratulate uh, Frank Mortimer on being recently appointed to the Parks and Recreation Conservation Board and thank him for stepping up to volunteer and serve. Uh, Frank brings a lot of expertise as an apiarist, <coughs> and it's a great addition to the board. We're already working on a very exciting community project, and more to come on that. Um, CBDAC met on June 13. The committee was uh, looking into how uh, business improvement districts work, and whether or not something to, for the uh, village council to consider uh, in exploring. There's still some, some more um, research to be done. Uh, we also spoke uh, at that meeting with a representative from Bauer, which will be designing a new website for the Central Business District. Uh, on June 18th, uh, Councilman Boyd and I had the uh, 
the honor of uh, attending the Chamber of Commerce uh, 92nd Annual Dinner. Um, we swore in the, uh, the new slate of officers. Uh, there were several individuals honored at the event as well. Uh, the owners of Jekyll and Hyde, Saul and Susan Gardner, were honored. Uh, they received the Community Business Award. Um, also, we had uh, Life Opportunities Unlimited receiving the uh, Community Service Award uh, and uh, the College Club of uh, Northern New Jersey receiving the, um, the Community Giving Award um, honoring Mary Schoendorf. Uh, congratulations to the new Board of Directors, Scott Leaf once again uh, stepping in as, uh, as President, Lisa Samatero, Vice President, Elise Marich, uh, Secretary, Rob Dowling, Treasurer, Paul Vagianos, past president, John Groom, executive director, and uh, also directors, Gary Collisair, Mary Ann Krantz, Ernie Lamour, Philip Davis, Ed Sullivan, Tom Hillman, Megan Frazier, and Millie Gonzalez. Uh, we already mentioned the farmer's market. Uh, I happened to be there on Sunday. It was really uh, absolutely wonderful. I picked up a lot of good stuff. And while I was there, I had a chance to uh, take a look at the newly configured train station parking lot. I think it was a great job done. I know our uh, engineering department was uh, intimately involved with it. I think it looks great. It looks a little bare now. We just finished the paving and striping, but the next phase will be the landscaping and the green areas. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, on June 20th, uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Knudsen, Councilman Voigt, Councilman Walsh and I attended the RHS class of 2019 graduation. And despite the rain, it was really a beautiful celebration. Uh, it was so wonderful to see the parents, you know, we're getting drenched and, and the students doing the wave. Uh, it was really all in good fun. <laughs> and uh, we were blessed with not one, but two beautiful rainbows um, that day. So it was a very special event. And that's all I have. I had a question. Sure. Um, I just, it's a question actually for Councilman Voigt. Did I understand you to say a bus stop at Newcomb Road? And well, so there's a, there's a, a school bus stop in the morning for uh, the, the students there. It, that's right, Chris, yes? Uh, yes, it is a school bus. I don't know if it wasn't clear in my mind if it's a Richard Board of Ed school bus stop or if it's a private school bus stop. Okay. Right. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we're going to investigate signage. Um, a resident brought to our attention that there are some site issues, so we want to go take a look at to see if some trees may need to be trimmed or whatever else needs to be done to enhance the visibility. Okay. Yeah. It just struck me as odd, so okay. Yeah. Uh, good point, Deputy Mayor. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll move on to our uh, discussion items. Budget. Uh, first item, we have a resolution for the Council's consideration to declare a piece of fire department apparatus surplus so that it could be traded in against the purchase of their new piece of equipment. Okay, and then we have the appointment to the Parks and Recreation Conservancy Conservation Board. And we'll see what our resolution is with the uh, number of residents, including, I believe, Frank Mortimer, you had mentioned. Yes. Get this all mixed up. Okay. Good. That was easy. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, motion to suspend work session. So moved. Second. Yes. Seaton? Yes. Boyd? Yes. Walsh? Yes. Hache? Yes. Motion to adjourn special public meeting and reconvene work session. So moved. Second. Knudsen? Yes. Seaton? Yes. Voigt? Yes. Walsh? Yes. Hache? Yes. <clears throat> well, the discussion, Ridgewood Water. Uh, first item, we have change order number one for professional engineer, engineering services for the Eater, Lakeview, and Southside pump stations. Uh, Rich Calby can further dis describe what is requested. So this is the first change order for this uh, professional services contract with uh, DJ Agarian Associates. It's for six thousand dollars. Brings the contract total to one hundred and three thousand dollars. 
uh, the change is necessary due to the need to upgrade the power service at the property that wasn't anticipated in the original um, RFP that was put out. We're upgrading to a 480 service, uh, so the additional fee is for the redesign associated with that upgrade and for the engineer to coordinate with Orange and Rockland, who is the utility provider in Wyckoff at this location. Any questions? Mm -mm. Next uh, item on the original water is uh, ward change order number one, professional engineering services for the Passaic Valley Water Commission pipeline project. Uh, Rich. Uh, so th this also was a, the first change order on a, a different design project, a professional mm -hmm. services contract with suburban consulting engineers who was hired by uh, the council to design the Passaic Valley Water Commission pipeline for a connection um, with their interconnect down in Fairlawn. Um, we had to move a stream crossing on um, Harristown Road in, in Fairlawn. We're now going to be crossing in an open cut matter instead of a trenchless matter. So that requires permits from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. So this change order in the amount of $10,000, which brings the contract to $159,175 um, um, is necessary for that permit work. So that, that's, that's for the permit, the 10000 That's what it costs? Costs for s preparing and submitting the permit, okay. yes. Was that something that should have been anticipated? No, what, what was anticipated in the design document and the RFP was to go trenchless. We were going to cross on the opposite side of the street and go under the stream trenchlessly as opposed to digging it up. Um, but when we had now to move to the other side and we found it was more cost effective to go open cut because otherwise we'd have to acquire property. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then we have an additional award of contract mm -hmm. for line stop and valve insertion to Corner Brothers. Rich. So th this is a two-year service contract that was awarded in 2000. 17 um, for 2018 and 19. Um, we um, recommended and the council did approve um, an award not to exceed of $100,000 for this year's services. We've exceeded that amount already this year as a result of the number of water main breaks that we've had. Uh, so we're looking to add an additional amount to the not to exceed. So this is not a change order. What this does is it just adds on to the not to exceed number and we pay based on the unit prices that were in the original service contract bid. So, so Rich, what, what does it mean that we're having a lot of emergency main breaks? I mean, that's a lot of, a lot of money. Well, I, I could tell you um, we're doing a lot of maintenance on the system. Um, as a result of the Water Quality Accountability Act, we're now required to turn our valves on a five-year rotation. As a result of that, many of the valves break we found that they're, they, they're broken. Um, we had an issue on Memorial Day weekend. We had three breaks in a row um, that were a result of work that we had done maintenance-wise and other ones that were non-related but were water main emergencies as a result of some paving work as well that was being done in the village. Um, so how does that happen, an emergency, uh, emergency main break? What, what, what goes on? Our, our system in many areas is as old as almost 100 years. Uh, so the, the pipes, as a result of you know, soil conditions or just material, how they were manufactured, um, you believe it or not, our older pipes are better than some of the pipes that were installed in the 50s. Um, so that, that iron wears or the soil may corrode it, or we get water hammer where pressure changes in the system and then causes the pipe to break at its weakest point. Or at these locations where we have the valves, the valve stem to break off, water just comes out of the ground like an artesian fountain. And we're often then forced to put in these insertion valves to control and isolate that break. Because we don't have valves that often. Some, some cases are thousands of feet away. So we put insertion valves in to isolate the air and avoid shutting down hundreds of homes. Um, in the case of a Glenrock break we had the week after Memorial Day, if we didn't do insertion valves, we would have to evacuate the entire Glenrock High School and Middle School and several residences of the area. But instead, by doing the insertion valves, we were able to just isolate to two or three homes. So the, the cost is worth, you know, you know avoiding that, that nuisance. So. 
and it gives us better control along these the valves we're putting in are long lasting so in the event there was a future problem in that area we have control what do you mean by long lasting they they have a life of 50 years or more oh. they're no different than a regular valve we would be put in is just a regular construction so, okay. but they're called insertion because they're put in live the main is under pressure and they are, they're inserted and then we can control it and shut off that small area um, Rich, can I just ask a question? So, so the original contract was a hundred thousand, and now you have an additional one hundred and fifty. So, what is the scope? Was the was the first uh, two year contract were all of those insertion valves completed? Like, why is this one now as an emergency fifty percent more than the two year contract that we started with? The the original contract had no contract total. We arbitrarily picked the not to exceed based on what we anticipated we would need for the year. It's a service contract, so it's just a bunch of unit prices that the contractor holds for the period of two years. And then every year we set an amount at the beginning of the year that we feel we're going to need to appropriate for that work. This year we fell awfully short, unfortunately. You know, we should have went with a higher number. But it's no telling what's going to happen in a given year in terms of emergencies. What we're looking at this year just based on what's happened already and knowing that we have the rest of the summer and then we have the fall and early winter, we just we don't want to come back to you with another additional award towards the end of the year. So that's why we're asking for the 150. But just to give you a level of comfort, finance doesn't give us all of that at once. They will give us a purchase order in parts. So, for example, this year when we had the $100,000 that was approved, they gave us a purchase order for 25000 when that was utilized, then they gave us 35000 Then they gave us the balance. So they will do the same thing with this $150,000 of authorization. It's not a blanket PO that they give us for the total. But based on what you had planned for 18 and 19, are you on par with what you planned or? Ab above what we planned. Above what you planned. So you completed all the ones that you had thought and you've done additional. In Correct. That. Okay. Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, the final item on the water is to declare a 2004 Ford F-250 surplus. Um, Rich, you want to add anything to that? The only thing I could add, I believe we've already replaced this vehicle. It was just, it was sitting around needing to be declared surplus so we could finally sell it on Gov deals. Um, Parking, there's nothing for this meeting. Under budget, we have the Richwood Senior Citizens Housing Corporation. Um, Mary Jo Gilmore, our tax collector, prepared a resolution for the council's consideration for their, because they are exempt from paying property taxes and they have a pilot, mm -hmm. a payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, another item to be declared surplus property, uh, traffic and signal has been removing a lot of the individual and duplex meter housings with the implementation of the multi-space meters. These are now surplus. Uh, we have piles of these housings, so there's a resolution for the council's consideration to declare them surplus, and then we will seek to sell them uh, any way possible. And it's just the housing, not the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. okay. So these would be the ones from Broad Street? Uh, these would be from the train station, okay, right, uh, train station. North Broad Street. Okay. Uh, also, those, I think the Chestnut, no, that Chestnut lot hasn't had meters in yeah. 10 years. Yeah. Other locations where we've put in the multi-space meters. Okay. A, we have an award of contract for vehicle tracking equipment. Um, this, again, is something, a program that's been initiated by Rich. Um, we have found this to be very successful. Uh, We've used this for a lot of different aspects of the Public Works Department's functions for the village. Uh, if people call and say we've never plowed their street, many times we can see with GPS the cycle and the frequency of plow has gone down the street. Same thing for leaf collection. Um, if the vehicle has a GPS unit on it, we can see when the vehicle went down a street. So if a resident says they didn't come down my street, we can see when they were there last. And it also helps in enforcement. If we've cleaned the street, we can show when we last clean it in relationship to any observations the code enforcement person makes. Anything you wish to add? Uh, just 
I have a question on yeah, that. Sure. Does yeah. it, um, our unions are aware of this and it, it conforms to our human resource manual? Uh, the unions are aware of it, um, not unnecessarily which individual vehicles have the units. That is a uh, strictly in management's hands. Um, the vehicles, the units are also programmed for, at times for like a geofence, mm -hmm. so that if a vehicle leaves a designated area, um, an alarm would be sent to the responsible director, mm -hmm. and then they could say, okay, that person is running an errand, it's what he's supposed to be doing, or oh, that person's not where he's supposed to be. Okay. And uh, we've had discussions with all the blue collar unions, and they are fully aware of it. Okay. Does it actually, does it, I mean, in terms of just um, from a blue collar worker perspective, isn't it, do they appreciate that actually? Because I would imagine that based on what you said, um, being able to say, oh yes, they did this street, they plowed this street, they did pick up recycling, in a way that's a benefit to the uh, to staff. I mean, it, I, it is a benefit. That is a benefit. Uh, the detriment in the staff's eyes, they feel that Big Brother is watching them. Right. But uh, we in management feel we have to do, we have to exercise every means possible to provide a value to the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So if the vehicle is supposed to be somewhere picking up something and we see it's not doing as the individual was directed to do, we can immediately take uh, an action and inform that operator of that vehicle. You're supposed to be on your route, you're supposed to be doing this, why are you not where you're supposed to be? And then the GPS would tell you how much time was spent in this specific area? They do have features that tell us if a vehicle is idling or a vehicle is parked. Um, you know, employees are allowed to go pick up a lunch. They're allowed right. to do that, of but course. they're not allowed to spend three hours picking up their lunch. Right. That's okay. prohibited. And the GPS does tell us how long they spent in front of, say, a deli. See, I wasn't thinking that way, not at all. I was thinking more like how long does it take somebody to collect garbage yep. in a particular area. I wasn't thinking about somebody going to get lunch. It never even crossed my mind because I assume people have to eat. They right. go and get food. But I was thinking more in terms of how long, you know, just from an efficiency perspective, mm -hmm. is that helpful? We're, we're looking in. That's why we're proposing to you to complete the fleet. Right now it's on only 70 vehicles, so we want to complete the other 50 and then utilize those analytics. It's completely um, the program works with our geographic information system, mm -hmm. so we could export that route data. It literally shows you the track of the vehicle every day over time. So example for sanitation or solid waste recycling, you can track those routes, put them on a map, and then look at how long it takes each route and comparatively decide maybe the routes need to change. Maybe there's something different we need to do. Or, and staffing levels maybe need to be tweaked. Some of it's yes. thinking more of it from an analytical perspective, it probably is helpful. Maybe there's a more efficient route. Right. We could save fuel, mm -hmm. you know, time idling. Right. So that, that's the main purpose. And, you know, to, to further on the employee side, we've got complaints during snow plowing and speeding. We're able then to go in the system and see what the actual speed of the vehicle was. Mm -hmm. And in each case, the, the um, employee was not speeding. So they're able to share that information and with that's the a good uh, thing. customer. I mean, yes, I, I, I feel yep. like that if I were a, a staff member and somebody was making that comment and something showed that I wasn't, I, I think that would be a good thing. Plus, for insurance purposes, it's probably yes, helpful. Okay. it's a very useful tool. Mm -hmm. Good, mm -hmm. thank you. And then we have a final item on the budget. We have a lease, a release of escrow for Flows Market. That is our vendor for the concession stand in the train station. Um, we had rebid that earlier this year. They again were the successful bidder. Um, due to the economics of the operation, there is a lower yield to the village, lower rent that they're paying, and so there is an excess amount of escrow being held by us, and they've requested that it be refunded. And that uh, resolution is for your consideration. Okay. Under policy, we have nothing tonight. And under operations, we have Memorial Park at Van Ness, the Village Tree Assessment. And tonight we have the pleasure of Declan Madden, our certified tree expert, this company here. Uh, his report should have been in your packet. Uh, Declan, would you like to go through your report for the council? Sure. Good evening. Do you want to sit at a table? Um, on uh, June 12th. Uh, Declan, you can, you can use the chairs here if you're more comfortable. Just make sure the light's on on the microphone, please.
On uh, June 12th, I did an inspection at uh, Van Ness Park, uh, Memorial, Memorial Park of Van Ness. Um, seven trees were in bad shape and need to be removed. Um, there were <clears throat> four ash trees, uh, two oak and one Norway maple that uh, upon inspection we, um, we decided that they need to be removed and the fact that it was such a large amount of trees in one particular area, I guess we put it before the council to consider it. Is there, a, is there a problem with that area that they they just dying because of the soil or what, well, what's the, going the on? The ash trees have um, ash yellows or ash decline, which is a, um, a disease that messes up the vascular system of the tree, which is, um, it, it interrupts the uh, phloem tissue underneath the bark, which which stops the, the tree's ability to, to take nutrients and, and water out of the soil. So that's the ash trees, and then the two oak and the maple have uh, structural problems like large cavities, defects in the stem that could cause the, uh, the tree to break out in a, in a storm. And how, how old are they, the trees? Um, the oaks are probably 100 years old, I would say. The ash are probably younger, and the Norway maple is probably 50 or 60. Okay. Um, I have some pictures. If People want to take a look at them. Sure, I love yeah. photos. This is the ash tree that has a bad day. Yeah. Uh, we all, oh, we have this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, okay. Uh, yeah. There's very little light, but in the cavity, it's like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's the ash. I have some exactly. pictures of the other the structural uh, that defects yeah. in the other tree as well. Yeah. These are the worst ones. Declan, could you sit and speak into the, the microphone, microphone, please? <laughs> Thank you. Wait, can we can keep these. Yeah. The, the ash trees that you have the pic uh, picture in front of you are the trees that need to be taken down, um, you know, quickly because they're, they're in the worst shape. Are are we going to replant other trees there? Like, what, are you going to make a recommendation uh, to plant, or just to kind of thin this area? Because obviously, there's a lot of good mm -hmm. growth of the other trees right. there. Uh, right now, there's no plans to replant. Um, I'm just here to speak about the removals. I, I I'm not really sure what happens with the okay. replant. Okay, thanks. Is it, so I guess that I, just in terms of what um, Councilwoman Walsh's point, though, is it a little overcrowded there, in your opinion? Um, I mean, the, the, the date inside where the ash trees are, I mean, when we, when we remove those trees, I, I don't think it's going to be um, a huge impact because... You still have trees flanking the corners. Okay. We will, as a town, remove the trees. We won't contract this out. No, no, we, we'll do that in-house. We'll do it in-house. Yeah. Okay. Um, and when do you plan on removing those? Uh, we'll, we'll have to try and do it as soon as the schedule allows. I mean, we're, we are booked out, you know, a couple of months already into the, uh, you know, but uh, we'll try and expedite it and get them done as soon as we can, because you know, with public safety, I mean, it's a, it's a highly, it's a high intensity use area in the park, and there's a lot of sidewalks, people traversing the park, and going around the perimeter and everything else. That we're a little concerned that, you know, if something happens, maybe somebody might get hurt. If we were to put in other trees there, would they? You think they'd thrive? I mean, is 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 the soil good enough to? If, if the p proper tree is selected for that site, yes, there would be there would be no problem, and we have irrigation up there too, so yeah, that helps a lot. Okay, you know. Okay. Uh, Declan, could you comment further on the emerald ash borer? I believe your report said there was none evident there, and I think that's a good thing. No, it's not evident that at this location we have um, got positive. Uh, detection of it on the uh, 500 section of Windermere, which is the dead end of Windermere, down by Pershing. Mm -hmm. um, those trees on that cul-de-sac down there, they, they have been positively detected for emerald ash. These, the trees at uh, Van Ness don't have any signs of it. There's no exit holes. Um, the bore, when it exits the tree, leaves a D-shaped exit holes. There's no exit holes. 
there's no um, excess of woodpecker damage because you know the woodpeckers try to get the borers when they're in the tree. There's no bark splitting. Uh, there's no flecking on the bark. Um, there's there's really no indication that it's ember lash borer at this time, but we do have it in Ridgewood. The trees at the end of Windermere and the dead end. Who who owns those trees? We do. We do. Got it. Okay. They're all. Uh, I've seen the trees Declan refers to. <clears throat> he and I have had many conversations about them. Uh, the great majority of them that are in very poor shape are within the public right away. Okay. All right. Yeah. Do you, you want this photo back? You can have that. Oh, too. you can you can hold on to them if you, you want. I have copies. What we'll do for the council's consideration at their public meeting, we'll have a resolution that can memorialize the council's council's decision on this recommendation. Good. So, I mean, do we need to? I mean, if if Declan has availability, when's our next public meeting? Uh, July tenth. July tenth. But if he has availability, do why? If it's a public safety issue, why? Do we need a resolution to remove the trees? I mean, do we typically don't do that, right? A lot of actions we do get resolutions so the council can express its uh, voice and is also aware of it. Um, I know in public works, a lot of things we like resolutions because many times residents come up to us and they may come up to the tree crew in this situation and go, what the heck are you doing? Right. And a resolution in hand helps explain that the governing body, you folks, are fully aware of the actions being undertaken. No, and I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying, but if there's opportunity to remove a tree prior to that and it's a public safety issue, then that doesn't prevent Declan from having the tree removed. That is so true. If, if it's, there's a window of opportunity between the, now and then, he could... If the tree crew ahead. is available, again, that they have right. to check that's what I guess I'm asking is that that's the question, just to make sure that if the, tree, if the crew is available to do it and it is a public safety issue, I would imagine that it's more important to get that done than, you know, the resolution mm -hmm. can follow. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. That's all. Thank you. And then we also have one final resolution, which is to authorize uh, the signatory for the DEP permits for the draining and the work at King's Pond. Uh, we're currently we're currently in the fish salvage operation phase, um, and that has necessitated about three or four additional permits with DEP and, as a and they all need a signature and we've got a very tight time frame because we need to get this done within the next week or so so we can work and partner with Bergen County to do the actual dredging. We set up a pump there uh, this afternoon to start drawing down the pond so we can catch some more fish hopefully at the end of the week. Where, where do you put the fish back in when you're done? Pardon? So where do you where do you put the fish? Actually, <laughs> they're getting relocated just a little bit south over the dam to okay. the body of water that's also known as Gypsy Pond, yeah. which is downstream of Kings Pond. Okay. What Good. about those big carp? Uh, carp were killed. Uh, DP consider them an, an invasive species, and they are not to be Re repopulated. Repopulate. Got it. Okay. All right. Go back to um, public comments, not to exceed five minutes per person. Uh, good evening, Boyd Loving, 342 South Irving Street. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Rudishauser read the hours for Graydon Pool. I believe there was a errata in there. Uh, beginning on June 24th, on weekdays, the pool opens at 10 a.m., and it will remain open from 10 until 7:30, 10 a.m. till 7:30 p.m. from June 24th through August 14th. He indicated that the pool weekday hours were 12 noon. That uh, was from June 3rd through uh, June 23rd. So, anybody out there who wants to go to Graydon on weekdays? It opens at 10 a.m. now through August 14th, according to the website uh, data on the website. Uh, there was a comment made tonight about available parking at the train station. I've observed the same thing uh, a couple of occasions. I drove by there after the lot was uh, completed, not fully striped, but completed, and noted that there were more than, on one day, more than two dozen spaces, and on another day, more than a dozen available spaces. And the thought just occurred to me that when you sold permits, I believe you put a limit on the number of permits. So perhaps the reason the lot isn't filling up is because there are no permit holders to fill it up. 
Um, so maybe a, a good idea would be to put a note on the website that additional permits are available now that you've got a larger lot. Otherwise, those spaces are going to remain empty. I guess somebody could go there with Park Mobile, but that costs a, a lot of money to do it on a daily basis by Park Mobile. So maybe you should uh, think about offering some additional permits, prorate the permits because we're already uh, coming up to July, but those spaces may remain unused unless additional permits are offered. Uh, and I, as I said, I think I recall that there was a limit on the number of permits because the lot could only hold a certain number of cars. But now that 32 spaces have been added, there are that many more spaces available and a corresponding number of additional permits should be offered in order to fill those spaces. And if the spaces don't fill, if people aren't going to buy permits, the question is have we reached the saturation point with parking? Have, do we have enough parking for commuters? If we can't fill that lot, do we have enough parking for commuters and should we rethink uh, some things that are going to happen down the road in a little bit? Uh, I would hope that people want to park there and offering them permits on a prorated basis will cause people to rush to get them, but if those spaces remain empty, have we overbuilt? So we need to consider that, or you need to consider that. Thank you very much. So, Thank you. so just, I, I just want to respond to that because by design, those spaces that are presently that will remain empty, uh, underutilized at this point, as the garage build moves forward, the, um, the cars that are displaced is the exact, almost the exact number mm. in, that are in that uh, train station lot. So those displaced vehicles, rather than do, um, what was that, a ride share program? Mm -hmm. Rather than do the ride share and upset um, the residents' routine, they're going to be able to use their Hudson Street parking park pass and uh, just move over to the train station lot during those months. So the open spaces actually presently serve a, a, an important purpose so that we don't um, inconvenience our the uh, RPP holders from Hudson Street. Okay, I understand that the Hudson Street people will have a place to go, but right now the spaces are empty. The yeah. Hudson Street's going to be closed, I think, by the end of July or August. August. Yeah, so we're so looking August. at a very short window of opportunity of, of, of um, empty spaces, and so we're comfortable and, and uh, moving forward that that's exactly the allocation required for the displaced vehicles um, at the Hudson lot. So it's just that they're not they're empty right now, but they will not remain empty. It, it's kind of worked out in a <clears throat> in a good way. There were some questions on social media about the price difference between Hudson and the train station. That is, people who have paid for Hudson at a reduced rate are now going to be able to park at the train station for. Right. So I, I guess is there going to be some adjustment made for that, or is that just the luck of the draw? I think it's going to be the luck no, of the draw. draw. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Good evening, Ann Loving, 342 South Irving Street. Um, there was a suggestion made on social media that maybe on the night of the 4th, before the fireworks begin, collection buckets could go around at some of the unpaid popular viewing spots for the fireworks, like the King's Lot and um, I guess the high school field. I don't know if that would be appropriate, but you know, I know we're trying to get money to fund this, and it's a thought that maybe some of the many volunteers who are working on um, the 4th of July celebration, they might be able to do that. Thank, Thank you. you, Ed. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, with that, we'll close public comments. Um, just a reminder, our next meeting, the next time we're back here is July 10th for our public work session at 7.30 p.m. And I want to wish everyone a safe and happy Independence Day. Thank you. Good night. Happy have a board. motion? Yeah. So moved. I'm moved. Oh, you moved to close. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone Aye. opposed? Aye. Thank Aye. you. Aye.